Quick question, have you ever missed an opportunity in your life? Uh, have you ever been at a place where you had regret? You were like, what were, like, how did, how did I miss that? that? Well, that actually happened for my wife, or almost happened for my wife. Uh, we were dating, and, and she had t- it's, it's funny, y'all got that faster than the 9 a.m. got that. We, we were dating, and she initially told me, she said, I don't just date to date. Like, she said, if we're going to do this, we need to take it seriously, courtship. We need to ask the questions that bring us to the place of marriage at some point. If, that's, if we're called together, let, let's treat it seriously. And I was like, well, I'm peace. Oh, okay, I'll do it. And so we did that. We, I didn't just date to date, right? And so as I'm doing this, we, things are going well. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, I think we need to get married. And so I began, now I did some soft ask, I know, I know, but I didn't want to get down on one knee, and then she said, no, I ain't, uh, we ain't, like, I, I, so I kept asking her softly, hey, you want to get married, like, let's do this, and she's like, I'm not quite sure about it, and I'm like, what? I thought you said you just don't date to date, right? And so, so I'm like, come on, let's get married, and then finally, finally, we went to Africa, and she saw me with beautiful African children and, and teaching them American football, but, but it hit her heart in this moment. She said, that's a person that could be a father to my children. Oh, is right. <laughs> See, she didn't miss her opportunity. <laughs> and we're in, we're in a, a, a beautiful passage of scripture. This is uh, Palm Sunday uh, for the church. Uh, called the triumphal entry where, where Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And as he comes into Jerusalem, everybody's excited, they're exuberant, there's elation going on. And as this, this crowd proceeds to cheer on Jesus, there's others that are not too happy about it. And so let's dive into that today. In, in Luke, the 19th chapter, the 37th verse, it says this, Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a quiet voice. We put it up there so you can correct me. Look at your neighbor, say loud. loud. All right, if you do, you're going to need to get this. Loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest, that Psalms 118. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd. Y'all know those kind of church people, right? Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now watch this. Watch verse 40. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. I want to speak to you from this topic, don't let the stones take your place. Don't let the stones take your place. Uh, there's this movie called The Matrix. Uh, don't, not the second or third one. They need to be redeemed. But the first one, <laughs> in, in the movie The First Matrix, there's, there's this idea, this premise that while we see this world around us, there's a, there's a greater reality that if you just take the red pill, you could see what's really going on and see... It's beautiful because it really speaks to the Christian worldview that there's a greater reality going on even right while what you can see, touch, and taste is in front of you. There's a spiritual realm, and this what we can touch is actually a shadow, Scripture says. It's just a reflection of the spiritual world, of the angels and the demons and the glory of God and this fight over the souls of people. And, and, and here's the thing that many of us were, ne- were never, never able to connect with that dimension, that reality, because we're, we're caught up too much in our own stuff. We're caught up, caught up too much in the day-to-day. And when you're able to praise God, when you're able to rejoice in Him and not miss the opportunity, what you find is you step into this realm of the God moments. And it takes a loud voice. Okay, okay. So 11 a.m., we're going to wake you up today. We're going to wake you up. 
I want to talk to you about praise. I want to talk to you about praise. I want to talk to you about not letting stones take your place. Not letting stones take your place. I, the, the first point that I need you to get is praise is a passcode to his presence. Praise is a passcode to his presence. Um, I don't know how he does it. So I got, I got three daughters, and then my fourth is a son. We didn't set a punt, and we went for it. And the fourth, we got a son, and, and he's definitely the baby of the family. But there's something, I don't know, I don't know what he knows, but if he goes to Walmart, just him and my wife, he comes home with a toy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, know what, I don't know what kind of tricks he's got going up, but, but he just knows how to, to get to my wife's heart. And here's the thing. God gave us an ability to get into his presence, and it requires praise. Three of y'all getting that right now. It requires praise. Psalms 100, I think a beautiful psalm to the passcode to the presence of God. It says this, make a joyful, quiet noise. Y'all, get, y'all, y'all see that up there? Sh- you say, but pastor, I'm an introvert. That's what the world told you, right? It, it doesn't say make a joyful shout unless you're an introvert. It just says make a joyful shout, right? Make a joyful shout to the Lord all you land. Uh, I hear your second rebuttal already. You say, but God's not deaf. He, here's, here's what I find. Most people believe that they don't need to shout because God's not deaf. But God's not asking us to do this for His sake. See, the passcode, the the, the wall you're trying to get through is not God. It's the hardness of your heart. Make a joyful shout unto the Lord. I love this verse too. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence. So we're not just like trying to entertain you up here. It's not a concert. We actually believe that when we sing together to him, he shows up. You need to get that. We differ than a lot of churches. Some churches think, well, I need to entertain my intellect. We need to have good doctrine. Not that I don't think good doctrine is important. But in this church, and we are the crazy ones, when you come here, some of the visitors are like, what did I show up to? It was just the first church that showed up in Google. I don't know what happened. You came to the crazy one. Anyway, so, but, but God says to come into his presence, the protocol is to sing. And it's more than a concert. You know, uh, I love our worship leader, Ben. Uh, beautiful, loves Jesus. What you probably don't know about him is he comes from a church of Christ background. You don't know anything about Church of Christ? That's cool. I didn't either, but they don't, they're not allowed to have instruments, so I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> they usually have the best pitch-perfect voices, but see, but we found out in the Scripture as we were reading the Bible that the Bible wants us to sing into His presence. The Bible wants us to bring instruments, and this is what He requires of us. So... You with your hands in your pocket saying, I ain't going to sing, whatever. Oh, wow. Light show. That's cool, I guess. You know, hopefully we get to the preaching part. That's the important part, right? And, and what you're missing is his presence. You're missing it. Not me. You. And, and here's what I find like crazy awkward about you. I, I don't mean to step on your toes, but I'm doing it today. Is that you'll shout at a TV about a coach who don't care what play you call. You should have passed, coach. You should have passed. You can have coach's personal cell phone number. He going to block you after that day, right? He don't care what you got to say. But see, we worship a God who actually cares when you sing. He wants to answer your problems. He wants to be there for you. He knows the amount of hairs that are on your head. And he says, when you come into my presence, I want you to sing. I hear your third rebuttal. I hear it. But I can't sing, Pastor. I got you. You think Simon Cowell's in our church like going to be like, you ain't making it, right? You... But that's not how it works, my friends. It's not the echoes of earth that God's looking for. He's looking for the harmony of heaven. And see, the harmony of heaven is reached when you make a joyful noise unto the Lord. 
So you can have one of those raspy voices because you smoked for 20 years. God bless you, right? But it ain't about the sound coming out of your mouth. It's about the heart that connects with heaven. And people probably look at you, what's wrong? Why? Do they know they can't sing? And see, there's something in your, and there's something in your heart that says, but do you know where I've been from? See, because a, a person that gets that, that loses the care of what other people think about them, and they start notice they praise God for all that He had done. When, when you begin to praise God because of what He took you through, like I think a, I think a Tina, like you see here down at, just on her knees worshiping, but she she ain't doing that for you. She just worship. You're like, oh, that's just that's just play. No, you don't know what she's been through. You don't know what God has taken her through. That she's at the place with God right now. We still growing, but but taking us to this place, and, and see you just like you just like eh, whatever, right? And I'm like, did God save you? Did He die on the cross for you? And when you get that, when you understand that, you don't care what people think about you. Then it's not about if I could sing or not sing. Mama said I couldn't sing. I I had that. Like I grew up. Uh, it, I'm the oldest, and my middle sister, Rachel, and then Grace was the singer in the family. She did all the specials at church. When they did the, we don't do those, don't ask. We ain't going to have you sing. But, but she would do that, and, and we'd be in the car, you know, singing Amy Grant. It was that, you know, Amy Grant, we all sing. We just love it, Jesus. We all have a good time. And my dad be like, shut up, shut up right now. This is Grace's part right now. Like, and you're like, oh. Right? And you get these complex and all this. But God don't care about your complex. God wants you to sing. God wants you to get loud. God wants you to praise him. I love verse 4. Go to verse 4. It says this, Come enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. See, when you get loud, when you praise him, what you're doing is you're actually humbling yourself. You're saying, I don't care if people see me. I don't care if I can sing. I don't care if I look ridiculous right now. I'm willing to humble myself because when I do that, I enter into his presence. I think of a lot of God in Scripture named King David. King David was, he had become king. He was dignified. He had the royal robe. He was, he was, he was the man, right? And then he gets into God's presence and they're singing and they're, he starts to just dance. And he's dancing so much, the clothes start coming off him, the Scripture says. He's, I don't know if he danced butt naked, but maybe just in a loincloth or something. But he's, he's crazy, so crazy, his wife looks at him and says, that's not what you She grew up royalty. She knew what kings were supposed to do. Her dad was a king. She's like, you're not supposed to do that. And he responds back, so important you get this in your heart. Watch as I become even more undignified than this. Yeah. What would it be like you're in your car because God touched you and his presence is there. And you're singing, ah, oh, Jesus, right? And tears are rolling down. Somebody pulls up to you, starts laughing at you, and you're like, ah, oh, Jesus, right? You don't care when you become undignified. So you can either keep your dignity and stay in your problems, or you can worship God and enter into his presence. See, because when you sing, when you sing your praise, second point, praise changes your perspective. Your praise changes your perspective. Uh, many people know this, this um, uh, a scripture out of Philippians. It's a coffee cup verse, and, and it's, it's a beautiful verse, and we understand that, that it helps us with our anxiousness and our worry and our depression and struggles with the day. I, I love it. It says this in Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 6. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So many of us know this, and so we say, well, I just need to pray to God when I'm anxious, pray to God when I have depression, and God's going to get me through my problem. He's going he's to give me that peace. But there's actually two verses above, a preparation that's needed before you enter into that place of prayer. Because your perspective needs to change before you can pray with the right heart. Okay, so I'm, 
I'm coming out of Germany. Some of y'all getting it, and, and, and I promise, I'm just going to keep giving illustration after illustration till we all get it. But, but I'm coming out of Germany. It was like a dreary and drab day. It was cold and snowy. I'm a Texas boy. I'm, I'm excited about August, right? And so I'm struggling with this. And if you know anything about Germany where I was, there was a lot of cloud cover when, when, when the fall hit to winter. And then like you're like, when is June going to hit? And so I'm there in December. Uh, the depression's setting in, and we're about to leave. And I'm like, thank you, God, for getting me out of here. But what I noticed is that when I got in the plane and we took off and we rose above the clouds, the sun was still shining. See, when I had the perspective of here on the earth, all I could see was my problems. But when I rose above, and see what praise does is it gets you to rise above the issues of your life. And so instead of just going to God with your prayer of, God, help me. Get me through this problem. I'm struggling. I need to get, have God, right? I'm going to be single for the rest of my life, right? But instead of all of that, you got to pick up before you get to six, you got to read four. And it says this in verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, when I was in military school, uh, they, they tried to make military school. It was easy for me as a finance officer. He said, if I repeat something twice, it's going to be on the test. Yeah. And see, so you got to know that you're going to have problems. You're going to have tests. You're going to have trials in life. And what God is trying to tell you through this passage is you have to rejoice in the midst of your anxiety. You have to rejoice in the midst of your depression. You have to rejoice. You say, but, but rents do, Pastor. I, I, I don't see anything. What, what is dancing? What is praising going to actually do? And see, what I'm telling you, it's more than just a good idea. It's going to shift your perspective so that when you enter into the place of prayer, you'll get actual results. We, we see this, it's a beautiful passage where Paul takes Silas on, on a missionary journey. And you think, they're, they're going out, they're preaching the gospel, you think God would have made it rainbows and sunshine for them, but they actually end up in prison, beaten, end up in prison, and they're struggling there, and Paul gets this crazy thing. He looks over at Silas, they say it's midnight. I'm usually in my fourth dream by that time. But they say it's midnight. He looks over, he says, sing, Silas. Sing, right? Silas is probably like, this dude is off his rocker right now. Don't he see that he wants us to sing? And Silas is like, okay, I'll, I'll sing. Get the shackles off my feet so I can dance. I just want to praise you. I just want to. That's not, that's not your Let's change the station. I'm no longer a slave to fear you. Who I am. Child of God. See, when they begin to praise, it was more than just a good idea. Their situation actually changed. Their perspective, it was more than just a perspective. Their prison doors were broken open, and that praise became a passport for their victory. And how many times have we got caught in the middle of our anxiety and worries and struggles of the day and instead of entering in and rejoicing and saying, God, I'm just going to be excited about life, we state our issues hoping God can fix it. And God says, I, I don't enter into that. I need you to rejoice. Okay, okay. Amen, amen. I'm going to go with that. What's beautiful is, is in this place... As your perspective is changing, you're going to find now that praise becomes part of warfare. See, it, many of us know that praise is a place of adoration, a place of honor, a place of thanksgiving, a, a, a place to acknowledge who God is. But what we don't realize a lot of times is praise is the actual warfare to get res the results of heaven down here on this earth. And see, when you can understand that, you're understanding the opportunities that are at hand. When I we went back to that passage of Jesus entering into Jerusalem and everybody's yelling, Hosanna! And, and, and the, the Pharisees there say, tell them to shut up, right? Like, they, they need to shut up. And Jesus says something that's really profound in this moment. He says, if they shut up, the rocks will cry out. 
Now, you, you, you may not get the connection, but I think he was alluding to what Paul was going to write to in Romans, the eighth chapter. He, he's going to say that all of creation is yearning, is, is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. That son's word is maturity. That, that the children of God would be mature. And, and so what's happening here is God is expecting you to praise him in a place of maturity. Let me say it like this. He wants to, you to praise him before you see the results. See, when you praise him in the present, you're putting a down payment on the future promise. And that's what a mature child of God does. It's easy to be excited when everything's going well for you. It's easy to put in the praise music and say, yay, Jesus is amazing, right? But it's another thing to praise him when all hell is broken loose. But it's that praise that breaks the chains. I remember my mother, uh, when, she, when she got a divorce, uh, she, she just heard the lie of the accuser. You're, never, you're unwanted goods. Nobody's going to want you. You're just, you're used. Why don't you just go ahead and end your life? And she had, had, we had a lineage in my family. My, her grandfather had committed suicide, shot himself in the front yard. And so here we had this lineage of suicide, and Satan's coming with that, trying to put that curse upon her. Just kill yourself. She started to have plans, started to have visions, just get a hotel room, take some pills, call it a day. But she had this word in her heart that said, I, you know what, if I could just put in this CD, well, it wasn't a CD in those days. If I could put in this cassette tape and just play and just praise, I know I'm just going up to work, coming back. I'm just going to praise him in the midst of this storm because she knew that was the only thing that was going to get her out of her depression. And sometimes she couldn't even sing the words. Sometimes her praise was just tears rolling down her cheek as she fixed her mascara to get back into work. But my friends, she praised her way through that situation. And see, when I went into depression in 2001 and I was ready to end my life, it was my mother who had praised God and said, I'm, I'm going to praise him. You know what, Trey? You just need to put in a CD. You just need to praise him. It'll get you through your situation. And, and I don't know why you're still sitting here. Some of y'all just need to take a moment and praise God for what he's done in your life. There's something about Jesus. And it's a weapon, my friends. It, it says that the, 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 the children of Israel would send the band first. Like, I was in the army, U.S., uh, Europe. I, I saw the band guys. They're not the dudes we're sending first. Just be honest. We send in rangers. We send in artillery. We ain't sending the band, right? But God says send the band first. At Jericho, what happened? They marched around, and on the last day, they shouted in the walls. What walls are in your life right now that need to come down? But you stay quiet. You state the problem instead of stating the promise. You won't praise. You don't see praise as a weapon. You think it's just waste. I'm just, I'm just shouting to the air. Who cares, right? But yet it's the activation of your faith. It's the maturity that's bringing about the sons of God. Are you going to let a rock cry out in your spot? Uh, in, in that same place in Jericho, when Jesus' day, it says that there was a, a man outside the gates of Jericho, blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. He sat by the roadside begging. And, and it says that one day he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And what did he do about it? Did he just state his problem? Ah, just a blind man. I'm just, this is just my lot in life. No, it didn't. It says that he yelled out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And see, in the midst of his yelling, you think the disciples would have got excited. Disciples who saw miracles. Disciples who saw blind eyes open. You thought they would have said, come on, man. Praise God like that. That'd be all, you know, some of those church people that are pointing you out while you're dancing and you're going through your thing, right? Why they got to do all that? Why you got your hands in your pocket, not understanding the reality of the world around you? That's what the disciples, shut up, man. He don't want nothing to do with you. And what does it say in the scriptures? He got louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. See, it was in that place that as he cried out, his wall came down. His spiritual blindness, his eyes were open. And how many of us, we sit through these songs, we think we're just waiting until the preaching and hopefully Pastor Trey has some funny story, right? Not realizing that when we sing, God shows up.
You are good, good. I'm not doing the woe part. Right? What does heaven think about that? And then you state all your problems and, and, and wonder why God's not doing anything because you, you haven't changed your perspective. You haven't used the weapon that God gave you to praise Him, to invite Him in. Remember, when they're praising, they're inviting Him into Jerusalem. What problem have you kept God out because you haven't praised Him? I think of my grandfather. Um, one day, instead of coming to the office, he felt like God was just... Asked him to stay, stay at home and, and praise him. And he put on a bandana and had some cut-off jeans. And you know anything about my grandfather? That's not him, right? He's, <laughs> he was like three-piece suit until about 10 years ago when we said, Papa, you don't have to wear the suit anymore. We love you. It's okay, right? <laughs> but tank top, cut-off jeans, and, and he put in, not with a CD again, a cassette tape, put in a cassette tape and moved the coffee table and just began to dance before the Lord. And if you're a naturally-minded person today, He's wasting his time, right? Science says he's wasting his time. Put the scientific method to it. He's wa- Maybe he changes his, his mind and his ideas, but he's wasting his time in all reality. But what happens when it's an actual weapon in the spirit? What happens is this. He gets a little crazy. He's dancing. And then the Lord speaks to him and says, you know that lady that's blind? I want you to call her up and tell her to come to the service tonight, and I'm going to give her her eyesight. And so he does that. After praising God, after worshiping for hours, he calls a lady up. He says, I heard from the Lord. He says, if you come to the service tonight, uh, you'll be healed of your eyesight. And I'm not picking you up either. And so i uh, like, <laughs> he adds that to the story, so I continue to add it. So she gets to the service that night. He prays for her eyes, and she's completely healed. So healed, she had to quit her work. She went back to her work to continue as an accountant. And, and so I need you to hear something. If you think this is just a waste of time, you're missing the important part of praise being a weapon. And in you, when you come into his presence, he's going to speak something to you. He'll give you a witty idea, an invention. He'll tell you how to get through that situation. He, he may actually make you look better so you can finally get that date, right? And so... That was an internal note. I didn't do that for the nine or the ten either. I don't know where that, I don't know who that's for me. Anyway, so I'm looking better already, baby, huh? But see, when you praise God, when you shout, when you get joyful, you change things. Not just you, you change things. And I think too often we are just, I mean, I see us. I'm our pastor. I see us and I'm like, what what am I doing? What am I not teaching to get you to to get after this thing? To treat this like he's really here. Because that's what I desire. And so we're going to have the band come on up here. We're going to rock again another song. I want to give you an opportunity. If we all stand together, I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give you an opportunity to encounter him. I want to give you an opportunity. This was a simple message today. I didn't go too deep. I just said you need to get loud and sing some songs. That's all I said. Right? But I said if you do that with a joyful heart, God shows up in your situation. And so we're going to open the aisle for my dancers. If you've never danced before the Lord, today's your day. We got the sides open today. We got aisles open. We just need to get crazy. We got one that's ready. Somebody's heard the word. Give me a high five, brother. Come on. Do we got any other dancers up here? Somebody, I know, I heard somebody say, my knees, my knees. Pastor Calvin will pray for your knees after this. Amen. But we need to get a little crazy for Jesus. If you've never sang before, I want you to sing like like you in the shower. I want you to just get loud for Jesus. I want to see us impact heaven. I want to create a church where it's not about the people coming, but about his presence. And so when you do this, I remember uh, one last story, one last story. 
I remember I was at a conference and, and they finished the meeting and they said, if anybody wants to just praise God, they can, they can just praise God. And I got over in the corner and I just began to spin like a top. Just wanted to be like King David and just dance. And it was when I was single and I started sweating kind of profusely. And this thought came to me because when you're single, you know, you come to these church meetings and you're like, hey, is there anybody around? Hey, what's up? And this thought came to me, nobody's ever going to want to, you're going to be stinking after this. Nobody. But then the Lord immediately spoke to me this thing. He said, it's not praise until you sweat. So I want to encourage you today, let's stop going through the motions. Let's stop, let's, let's, he's here. He's here. Let's dance, let's get a little crazy for Jesus, amen?